Here is an all too common scene, motorists running red lights. The state says constant violations of Hawaii's traffic laws have become intolerable, endangering the lives of other motorists and pedestrians and compounding the already hazardous conditions on our roadways. The state is considering red light cameras to catch motorists in the act. How will these work? Who will pay for them? And are they necessary? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The legislature formed a red light running committee to develop a policy for photo red light imaging detector system. Translation, red light cameras. They are not unique. Red light cameras are used in other parts of the U.S. and in other countries. Some say they work in making streets safer, but they have their critics too, lots of them. Our guests tonight are experts in traffic safety and bring varying perspectives to the red light camera idea. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBSY Facebook page. Now to our guests. Shelly Kanishige is with the State Department of Transportation, which is in charge of the Red Light Running Committee. Jack Tonaki is the State Public Defender, a position he's held since 2000. He's a member of the committee. Captain Ben Moskowitz is with the Honolulu Police Department's Traffic Division, and yes, a member of his committee too. And Carrie Bennis is the chair of the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, which supports red light imaging detector system. She's also a trauma systems public health educator with the Department of Health. And Carrie, I'd like to start with you. Tell me what red light cameras are, how they work, and how people end up getting tickets from them. Uh, well, red light cameras are basically, as we've seen in a depict depicted in the video, is uh, basically having a police officer available to collect evidence when somebody runs through uh, a red light. Um, what they do is they use technology both with coils in the, implanted into the uh, actual roadway system that's attached to the signaling system and there is both a combination usually of a photo taken as well as a video to capture the driver and or needed evidence such as the license plate if the um, individual violates going through the and intersection. And then if they get if they get caught what happens then? <coughs> uh, the citation or the evidence is then usually sent to the place that's designated so it can be um, a police station it can be uh, actually a vendor system where they actually examine things and they look at the different um, scenarios and make sure that it fits within the criteria that's been set up by the state or the county to say, okay, was did this person, you know, was there any, uh, did they fit the grace period, or did they not? Uh, was there a pedestrian or bicyclist present? Um, mm. Just various things that they can look at to just make sure that that ruling is just and fair. Oh, so Shelly Kunishiki from DOT, so that is that what this committee is gonna be looking at, all those kind of questions? And, and if, does it be, if we have a committee, does that mean for sure we're gonna get red light cameras? So what Act 131 does is it allows us to convene this committee and to start talking about pilot projects, what that might look like, the feasibility of these, who's going to pay for what, what kind of needed capital improvements would be need, would be put in place on our system um, for these red light cameras. Is there an assumption that they would that they would work, make things safer? There there are studies worldwide. Um, one in particular from from the National Highway Safety Transportation um, Administration says that you know worldwide results it reduces these violations the red light ones by 40 to 60 percent. Um, Jack Tanaki, I think you probably as public defender opposed this, or how did you feel about it when it came up? Yeah. We, we did, Daryl, and uh, the reason is that um, the in the vast majority of these cases, this, these uh, cameras have been. Uh, the the product of private companies, for-profit vendors, uh, who installed these cameras. So the public perception became it was a money grab, that um, uh, they were unfair. They've even been been accused in some places of shortening the yellow light to increase their citations. So is that it, just an accusation, or is that true? Well, <laughs> there was a lawsuit in California um, uh, where that was the allegation, and. Uh, uh, there have been any number of states where these red light cameras have been 
There have been actual bills in Texas, Ohio, where the governor signed bills outlawing red light cameras for the state was that because it was because, such a public outcry. Because a public outcry yeah. is, is political as opposed to actually being unjust. Right? Well, it's, it's very political because when you come down to it, people uh, don't like the idea of being told they broke, broke the law by machine. You know, oh, really? if, if an officer comes to court, says, I saw you go through a red light, okay, you caught me. Don't lie. They but, don't like that either. <laughs> but, well, I mean, they, but, but there's, Maybe a little there's more. something really <laughs> offensive yeah. about being mailed sure. a citation and then uh, saying that you, you broke the law. And uh, yeah. Where's the police department on this? You know, I think the, the, the evolution of this bill from when it was initially introduced to establish a committee and also to establish a program and to um, the, the feedback that the legislature took into account drastically changed the, the final outcome. So it got rid of a lot of the things that, uh, that Jack was talking about. And in fact, it specifically says we can't use a vendor. You can't use a for-profit vendor um, that's going to come in and give you a, a per citation kind of fee basis. So I, I think the committee is actually a good result um, because it, it starts a dialogue. Um, it gets the people to the table. And we can find out, if, figure out together if this is something that's going to work here. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But um, we need to, certain things we definitely need to look at. Yeah. As a, as a, as a long-time traffic um, investigator and leader of the traffic division, do you think that um, there is a way of, of making this work? And from the police perspective, what do you think are the key elements that it has to have to work? Well, I think there's a way to make it work. The, the, um, the model that I kind of like to look at is uh, the New York model. So in the New York model, um, there's one fine for if a police officer stops you and gives you a citation for speeding or for running a red light. There's a separate fine, which is a lower fine if you get the citation in the mail. The other thing that I like about the New York statute is it's not a vendor. The, the New York City Department of Transportation owns and operates the system. They purchase the equipment. Um, they have a police officer, a sworn officer, reviews the evidence. And uh, a huge part of law enforcement, even in today's world, is discretion. And so there's actually a police officer who's deciding based on this evidence that enough evidence exists to issue a citation. So I, I think that definitely takes away a lot of the, the arguments and the fears that people would have if, if uh, as opposed to if we went to like a, a van cam style system where for every citation that the vendor issues, they get a certain amount of money. That that's, that just scares people. Gary Bennis, in, this, in the history though you've seen, um, when, it, when, when something like this is put into a jurisdiction, what usually happens? The crash is decreased. Uh, that's, the, that's primarily why the Strategic Highway Safety Plan has put forward such a positive support about this is because um, it's both, it goes both ways, just like helmets, you know. As soon as you take away the law, the crashes go back up. Is, but do, do, they, do these things tend to give out a lot of tickets at the front end and then people kind of learn? Or what do you think, Shelley? Is it something that changes people's behavior right away or is it something that um, eventually, people, uh, eventually people learn? I think people learn, and from the studies um, worldwide, it also reduces red light violations at other intersections without the red light cameras. So I think everyone can agree running a red light is, is bad. I mean, people might not agree with the speed limits we set on roads. It, with all these safety factors or all these considerations, uh, Jack Tanaki, do you think that it could be something the Public Defender's Office could support at any stage? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I think uh, we're on the committee, so I mean we'll have input, and it, it seems as though it's this an, an enabling statute, so it, it's uh, uh, allowed these pilot programs. So it's not whether it's going to be allowed; it is going to be allowed. But um, we are going to have say uh, in that. And the important thing, uh, as uh, Ben was saying about the um, discretion of the police officer, that's one of the chief things that. People have complaints about, and even AAA stated in their testimony in the legislature that 60 percent, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the violations were not people blasting through the red light. They came from right, what they call right on red violations, where people making a right turn on red, but didn't come to a complete stop, and therefore got a red light uh, mm. violation from from the government, and. That kind of thing sets people off because it's reminiscent of the van cams where the public officials in charge said, well, one mile over the speed limit is speeding. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so it's um, so you're going to have to have someone review these citations before they're sent out to say, hey, is this really a, a, a violation that should be tagged? But I mean, if you do that, uh, anybody can throw in here. If you if you actually have that, but wouldn't that just be so cumbersome and slow that you know? I mean, that sounds like potentially thousands of tickets, but somebody paid by taxpayers is going to have to have to. So it's it's going to be rare, but Jack and I once again agree. Um, I think it has to be some sort of sworn person with experience and training and discretion involved that's going to have to do it. And if you compare the cost of having an officer stand at, at that same intersection, for instance, and wait all day for those same people to violate the law and then conduct traffic stops, expose themselves to the passing traffic, the, the risks and dangers inherent in conducting traffic stops, um, the, that cost compared to the cost of having that same officer sit at a terminal um, maybe one day a week and oh. rotate it and flip through the violations suggested by the system and using their discretion and the entirety of the evidence before they make a decision, hey, uh, it looks like this is a violation and issue the citation. So um, this process, who would decide which intersections would be uh, monitored by the cameras? Carrie? I ideally, the system is set up so that it's data-driven. So we would look at first where collisions are occurring, especially those that are involving fatalities or those involving a pedestrian, um, putting that as a high priority. But that's something that this uh, pilot has the chance to discuss and determine how they would rank those things. And the things like with the red light running, there might be a maybe a more of a, a red, right turn on red, they might decide that if there's nobody present and it's the middle of the night, and that might not be something that you give a violation for. Because I know it's like, it was interesting in the video that we've been seeing. I mean, I, we're all familiar with these intersections where we're seeing pictures of cars going through. We, we, the, sometimes it's the way the light is set up. In fact, I got a, one of our callers says, uh, you know, caller's a walker. He says he sees a lot of traffic lights where the green, the green man is only on three seconds. I think the green man is the walking man in the thing, uh -huh. right? Um, and it should be at least 10 seconds, but I think that you know, is the construction of our intersections and, because I know there's places where it's really hard to get to that intersection and know you're gonna have to sit there for like what seems like an hour if you get stopped by that red light. There's like the psychological incentive to blast through those intersections. How much of that is a consideration here? Like the, whether the intersections themselves could be better engineered as opposed to using a camera? Yeah, so that's... Well, I, I mean, we are looking into installing more um, connected and autonomous um, technology in our traffic signals. So um, in combination with either connected vehicles or apps like Travel Safely, you could be getting continuous information from these signals, such as like the presence of a pedestrian or bicyclists. So the technology is only getting better. And if there ever is a situation where you feel that the timing of a light is off or the timing of a pedestrian control is off, you can always let us or the city know and we'll check it out. You know, while we're talking about traffic lights, we had a, had a discussion before the show about, and I think this goes to more of what this caller is asking about, how short the green man is mm -hmm. up. But we were talking a little bit about the new law that says you can't step onto the pavement if that countdown starts. Um, there's an issue with that. Uh, right, so actually what the law did was it only clarified. It really didn't create any new... Um, new law. So that was, so, it's already was improper Right, so if, if you in. look at the countdown timer, the countdown timer is activated on one side and it's counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, and on the other side of that same signal is a flashing red hand, right? Next time you see one, you're going to notice both things are going on at the same time. So what the law said previously was if you arrive at the crosswalk and the signal says walk, or it's a picture of the white person walking across the street, the, the white signal walking, um, then it's okay to begin crossing the road. Once the red hand starts blinking or the don't walk starts blinking, um, then it's not okay to step off anymore. You have to complete your transit. So really all they did was put a timer next to when the hand started blinking. So the but presence of the, the timer is, is the same. But, but is that what the public perceives? Right, no, and I think that's the confusion and that's the issue. Um, like we said, if, if you get to the, uh, the Maybe you're jogging along the sidewalk and there's a particularly wide intersection and it's at 38 or 39 seconds like some of the ones are in Waikiki mm -hmm. and the thing starts to blink and you know I can get across this intersection in six or seven seconds. The natural tendency is going to be to, I know I can make it. And, and Come so on, Grandma, go. we'll walk together. <laughs> right, but unfortunately that's, or fortunately, that's not what the law says. Mm -hmm. So 
Yes, but, there's definitely but, a disconnect but, there. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that's why, Darrow, it's laws like this red light cam, it's going to be all about the application and do people feel that the way it's being uh, applied or the way it's being enforced is reasonable. And if it isn't, if, if the public all of a sudden feels like, well, the government, they're just trying to get more money out of us and they're being inflexible on the enforcement of this thing and I'm getting these tickets uh, because of some camera, uh, it, there's going to be huge public backlash like there has been in all these other states. One of the things that I heard um, was that in some places, people got so freaked out by the possibility of running a red light or being accused of running a red light, they just forgot all the rules that they've been taught about, oh, it's okay to enter if it's a yellow light. Right. And they just slam on their brakes on yellow and then they get hit behind, from behind by the person who... So, yeah, I mean, I was going to just say that in, in Suffolk County in New York, they did a study and there was a 60% 60, 60 increase in accidents, of course, the proponents of the red light say these are rear-end accidents, which are less deadly. But still, you're, you're, by installing these lights they, at some intersections, they were increasing collisions. But I mean, how long do you think that that would be a factor? I mean, right. until people well, learn, right? Yeah. Well, public education would be huge too, right? I mean, Carrie, how would something like this happen just out of the blue, or is it something that would? What kind of ramp up would there have to be? No, and I think we've learned our lesson from past that. We definitely need to give the public full opportunity to understand what's going on. Um, and that's what a model program does. It gives an opportunity to say, this is like today, start now, start stopping at those red lights. If you by chance m might be running and them or coming close, but um, yeah, the, the time is now to start talking about these things. That's why it's great to have this time period of a, a pilot uh, that should tell people uh, a good program will tell them where it's happening and when it's happening and to be prepared. Shelly, could you from DOT, so that would probably end up being in your guys' lap, that kind of public information. What kind of ramp up do you see and um, when we talk about a pilot, how soon are we talking about a pilot? When could that happen? The, re the report with recommendations has to be submitted 20 days prior to the 2020 legislature. So. You know, we submit the report, and I guess based on what the committee comes up with, that would determine when we could start rolling out pilots. Oh, I see. So th that would be determined, that's something to be determined by the committee. Mm -hmm. And also the availability of the technology, because a lot of stuff, you know, you have to order, and there's some lead time there. What is, it? is, is there a lot of new technology out there, um, Captain? I mean, in terms of being able to do this the right way without people getting all upset? So, or so, uh, so precise. Yeah, 18 that years ago when we started van cams, part of the legislation that enabled that was also to set up um, red light cams, right? And we were talking earlier that I can remember one being installed at Punchbowl and Vineyard and thinking, okay, I got to slow down and I got to stop and it changed my behavior, right? And I was a police officer. So um, I have to imagine that technology has leaps and bounds increased in 18 years, right? My cell phone from 18 years ago wouldn't even work today. So I, ha I have to imagine that out there in the world, there, and that's one of the good things that this committee allows us to do is get together and talk about what are the options. And because we're not tied into a vendor program where we're going to have to purchase an off-the-shelf um, vendor to come in and charge on a per citation basis, we might be able to build something um, that for relatively, I would imagine, inexpensive uh, that, that might work well. But I don't know. And that's one of the benefits, I think, of having the committee to explore the options. Um, uh, just to, to acknowledge some of our callers here, because we've kind of been through this, there should be central oversight rather than just contracting the service out. This will help prevent fraud due to the negligence and hacking. Yeah. That's a whole other. Is hacking an issue? That's good. Well, I mean, that's good input. Good, yeah. And so, um, okay, I'm not, we're going to get to speed cameras. There's the viewers like, what about those horrible speed cameras? Okay. Caller is against red light cameras, is not aware of an increase in red light violations or accidents. Good question. I mean, how much of a factor is red lights in, say, pedestrian accidents or fatal traffic accidents? Do we, I mean, you always hear about someone running a red light, and, but I mean, do we have a lot of fatalities connected with that or injuries? Locally, I can't tell you uh, huge numbers. I can tell you in 2017, there were 890 people killed in collisions nationwide involving crashes that involve people running red lights. And I think the Institute, Insurance Institute for Hawaii, Highway Safety estimated 132,000 people were injured in 2017 from red light injury 
collisions do nationwide. We have, do we have a local number? Locally, we have um, over the past five years of available data, there have been um, 1,616 crashes as a result of a red light or other stop control violation. Say that one more time, slowly. Um, Okay, so over the past five years of available data, okay. there have been 1,616 um, injuries as a result of a red light violation. So a couple hundred a year, that people get injured because of red light violation. Mm -hmm. Jack, I mean, that's a lot of people. What do you think? Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, no doubt that running a red light is extremely dangerous, but mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to state the obvious, but you know, this is just one aspect of the problem. It doesn't guard against intoxicated driving. It doesn't guard against speeding. It doesn't guard against inattentive driving. And frankly, I think just anecdotally, m most of the stuff I see in the news reports are those first three. Um, well, let me ask Jack, you, 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 I mean, I, I know you're the head of the office. You, you're sure. not doing a lot of individual cases. But when you've got a guy who's run a red light, and you could probably answer this too, does he tend to have a lot of other stuff on his record before, or they tend to be a guy who just randomly ran a red light well, just having to get caught? Right now, you know, we these don't. bad drivers yeah. that need to get tickets for, for their bad driving, even if it's their worst of their driving isn't running a red light, it might be, might be DUI, might be speeding. What do you think about that concept? Right now, we don't really represent people charged with just red light violations mm. because those are civil in nature. Oh, I see. Right. So, um, and... You know, I will say this, that the majority of neg neg negligent homicide cases that we represent people in are probably impaired driving. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't remember one where we had a, a running a red light case. It, it's, it's by far the most common is impaired driving. Speeding and impaired driving, you're absolutely yeah. right. But I mean, do you think that there's a, a connection, Captain, between a person who would be who runs a red light, blatantly runs a red light, to the point where he would get a, a ticket. Because I think you guys have a, lot, a fair amount of discretion. I mean, if I'm just barely running that red light, I might not get a ticket. But if, I, if that red light was red for 30 feet before I got to that intersection, you better give me a ticket, right? I mean, so when someone's caught blatantly running a red light, do they tend to have other problems with their driving? I, not in my experience. I don't think there's a there's a, any kind of positive correlation. You're killing my theory. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what my theory is, and I've said this repeatedly. It all boils down to cell phones. It's it's distraction. Cell phone as an example of distractions. People are doing things in their cars other than paying attention to the roads. Right. The the light turns yeah. yellow, and it's yellow for four seconds at almost every intersection I see on this island. You know it's going to be red. You're either distracted or you're in a hurry caused probably by some sort of distraction or other issue, mm -hmm. and you can make it. Yeah. I will say this, that many of the bad drivers that we get, we look at their traffic abstract, they're chronic speeders. Speeding is a real common, we, they got a lot of speeding tickets, so um, that is probably more common as far as uh, getting a lot of traffic charges. Okay, okay. we're getting kind of a lot of questions about this, so a couple of very specific. How soon after the light turns is the photo taken? How will tourists in rental cars be tracked down? Anybody? Go ahead. So, so the industry standard, I think, is between an eighth of a second and a half second. And um, I can't imagine, even as the police in the committee advocating anything less than a half a second. So okay, that's, so that's half, kind of the half second. So what the, does half second mean? The light is red, and a half second later, you enter the intersection. Then it would potentially take your picture. And a half a second at. 30 miles an hour, how far is that? Does anybody know? It's like, is no, that but 10, 20 feet before the <laughs> intersection? Remember, that's half second of red and four seconds of yellow. Okay. So the, the speed, the roads are designed with light, line of sight in <clears throat> mind that you can see a traffic light. If you're traveling at the speed limit, you should be able to stop well in advance. And just, just to be clear, what is the law about, does, does, can I, can I, have the light turn red while I'm in the intersection, is that okay? So currently the law is that when the light turns red, you cannot, uh, if there's a stop line, you have to stop at the stop line. If there is no stop line, there's some intersections without a visible stop line, then you have to cross at the stop at the crosswalk. If there is no crosswalk, painted marked crosswalk, then you have to stop before you enter the intersection. So as long as you, and I wouldn't advocate this, but at three and a half seconds, you enter the intersection, the light is yellow, then that's not a violation. Entering the intersection or crossing the stop line or the crosswalk 
when the signal is red is a violation. Okay, another specific question. Oh, uh, there, oh yeah, so what about tourists? Really? I I how, do, we know, do we have a way of yeah, getting them? So that's going to be a question too, is like, if, are you going to issue the citations based on the driver or the registered owner of the vehicle? Right. That was, we have another question here. Is it, you're not, these are the registered owners. So how does, it, how does that work? Carol, that, that, that's a good question, that's the, the tourists and uh, commercial vehicles, because uh, in Orlando, there was an uproar because the vendor there refused to, now this was a private vendor operating the, the, the red light cam, they refused, refused to pursue people who lived out of the country. And of course, Orlando's a big visitor destination, so just like Hawaii is. Mm -hmm. So they said it just wasn't, it, it was too much trouble to pursue, pursue someone out of the country, so they just didn't do it. And the citizens got a wind of that and said, you know, that's not fair that you come here as a tourist, you're breaking the law, and then we're being assessed, you know, all these fines. So. There, that's that brings up a, a interesting yeah, as question. Yeah, I recall with with the with the van cams, the 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 red car company would get the citation, and they were they were responsible for going after the driver, and otherwise, is that, yeah. that I, maybe I'm, this is 20 years ago now? So, have I got that right? Do you remember? Well, that's how it works with I mean even toll roads um, in other jurisdictions. Right. If you uh, sometimes you have to pay the fine online or whatever the fee is, mm -hmm. but they if you're using a rental car, that rental car agency will find you. I was just driving in Florida <laughs> recently, and man, the, the tolls were everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. So. There, there's really two concepts and two possible ways to kind of develop a red light running camera system. One is to create in the law a legal presumption that the registered owner is the driver. And if the registered owner is not the driver, then the, the responsibility falls to the registered owner to say who the driver was. Uh, the other way, which again goes back to the New York model that I was talking about earlier, is to change the perspective that it's not necessarily the person driving who's responsible for the citation, it's the registered owner of the car. So unless you're going to tell me that, um, you know, so Daryl was driving my car without my permission, uh, otherwise if someone's driving your car, you're responsible for the actions of the driver of your car. And then uh, that, that cleans that whole I, uh, issue of identification up as well. Is the technology though so much better now that you can actually really get a better view? Because I remember the, the van cam pictures were a little on the fuzzy side back then. They weren't really great. They had to have sun in going in the, I think that was when they also, that's kind of how they chose where to put them to make sure the sun was going into the car so that they could get better shots of the drivers. Um, it, but is the technology better now that you, you, you could actually most of the time get a good picture of the driver's face? Yeah, I believe so. At the car and the face, yeah. So, but that's a big issue to be discussed in the committee and eventually in the legislature. Um, uh, we did mention this earlier, uh, that there was an actual red light test that we did, like you're saying, like 2000, early 2000s. Did anybody know what happened with that? Did that just I'm not sure it ever went active. I, I know that it was um, it got discontinued right around the time that the legislature revoked the legislation that enabled the van cams. And I think they were both enabled at the same time, so they probably both got removed at the same time. Um, I don't know if we ever issued any um, any red light running camera citations. They, not to my knowledge. And, and, and finally, on this, did they um, make in most places? Did they make the fine that? from the red light camera less than if you get caught by an actual officer? Is there a difference between that kind of a citation or is it still the same violation? Anybody? New York's the only one that I found that, that did that. They had a two-tiered two system. Interesting. Well, I think that the idea of the, the vendor really does take a lot out, but then, then taxpayers end up paying for it. Right, so it becomes, again, it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? So if the red light camera reduces collisions at an intersection or it reduces injuries, it reduces fatalities, that has a real actual cost associated with it. Um, and then sometimes the argument is, well, the, the, if you issue less citations because you're using more discretion and leaving the yellow light longer, um, then, you know, the state's not going to get enough revenue from the citations to support the program. And... That, that's probably true, and I'd much rather have a program that is not self-supported because one of the misconceptions is, you know, we can't wait to go out and give a bunch of citations and make a bunch of arrests. That's absolutely not true. I'd rather not have to go to collisions, right? So in a perfect world, the system is not funded by anything because it issues no citations because people stop at the red light. And people so, drive with aloha. There you go. So um, 
you know, uh, color, this is obvious. We've been talking a lot about the speed cameras. Um, and it's been, like I said, I was shocked that here this is 20 years ago because I remember covering it like it was yesterday. <laughs> but um, just, uh, you were the public defender's office at the time. Yes. T describe what happened with that, as, as you recall. Well, it, it uh, as I recall, it was the, the, the chair of the uh, Transportation Committee. I, I believe it was House Transportation Committee at that time who um, really pushed it. And uh, of course, we were one of, if not the only agency, uh, one of the only ones that spoke out against it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course, we didn't, anticipate the uproar that would would result but we you know our voice went ignored and we said that it's not a good idea people don't want to be tagged for speeding and we had all those questions we raised all those questions at what level of speeding are you going to start tagging people is it mm -hmm. one one mile power over the limit or is it five or is it ten and they left it up to the vendor, I guess. And, and it, was, it was a private yeah. vendor issue, too. Do you think that was what really was the mistake, was using a private vendor? Oh, I think so. That's, that's what created enough public uproar that the legislature just had to get rid of it. I mean, I'm sure the state took a bath and paid a bunch of money um, as part of the contract, but... They did. Know. They had to pay them, yeah. But, but the, the thing was, it, it led to this tremendous number of speeding tickets. I mean, it was crazy, right? And, and so with, with, if you had red light cameras and all of a sudden you've got so many tickets for red lights, does that throw the system out of balance or can it, you know, just, does that become a burden in and of itself? So part of education would also be signage to let people know that they would be approaching an intersection with a red light camera. Mm. So hopefully that would, people are paying attention to the signage on the road as well and that would dissuade them from running that red light. Yeah, we come back to the education part piece again. Um, with the with the van camps, do you think though that the police, why is it the police department doesn't do some of this stuff on its own? Use new technology. You guys have radar guns. Do those have cameras in them? Uh, no, none of the ones that we purchased do. Um, they, they, it's an option. It's something that we could uh, but you don't really invest. need it if you're, if you're... Correct. It basically boils down to the officer's testimony that he or she tested the device. It was working properly on that day. Uh, they were qualified by the manufacturer. They used it on that day. This was the speed result. Um, and then why they believe the speed result to be true based on their training and experience. Do, is it legal now to send violations by mail? Because I know when I'm driving a zipper lane, there's a sign that says citations issued by mail. But I... I think that's the only, there's a special exemption carved out in the HRS for uh, HOV citations. Right now? Yes. So they could actually do that by mail now? But They probably could, we don't. Why not? I don't think we have any, so we have cameras that will like track your license plate to see how fast you're moving, mm -hmm. um, but it's not tracking your like individual data or your or any traffic violations you might be making, it's just, data we use for planning purposes. Okay, so at this point, no one is getting citations by mail. Well, I, not, not, not that I know of. And you know, it, it, I mean, it's always a resource issue. I mean, so if you're gonna develop a policy where sending uh, citations by mail, you need people to print those out, put them in an envelope. I mean, maybe that could be aut automated somewhat, but still people to do that. and that'll become an issue for this uh, red light cam also because if you need someone, an officer, probably more than one officer, a team of officers reviewing these pictures and then deciding, well, we're gonna mail out a citation, then you need a staff to get all of those citations sent out. Um, it, it, it's gonna involve quite a bit of staffing issues. But, but, they, but, but then, like you're saying, is if you can do it quicker and an officer can do more cases, without having to pull the driver over. I mean, is that something that, because I, I know recently you folks rolled out a system where the, uh, the officers had like a iPad or something to write out the tickets faster and prints it out and hands it to them. And, and that was touted as being great because you move along and you can get, you can, you can keep it better out. You don't tend to take 10 minutes to write a ticket. Sure. I mean, so the, multipli the ability to issue more tickets quickly would be facilitated by citations 
by mail, right? Um, yes, especially if we went with a, an automated system that would look up, for example, if I put in the license plate um, or maybe the photograph would suggest what the license plate was and I matched it to be correct, that it could pull up the make and model and year and the registered owner and pre-populate that kind of information. That would certainly be faster um, from a per citation aspect than standing at the side of the road and handwriting or even using an iPad device to issue a citation. Does that exist anywhere now, a system like that? Well, Stan? Well, so, you know, so just so I understand, so like you, here you are, traffic enforcement officer, you're on the side of the road, you've got your gun, your radar gun, and it, and it takes a picture when you, when, you, when you catch somebody. Instead of pulling that person over right away, you go back to the station and you have all of your cases and you basically are confirming, yep, that, I saw that, boom, 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 and sending them all out. Oh, yeah, you, that's technologically that's possible, well within our abilities, but the, the, the backstop against that now is it's not legal. Um, and I don't know that we'd want it to be, but that's, <laughs> well, okay. Night Camps is a whole series of shows. I know, I know. No, but I guess the, the, the question I'm getting at is, uh, you guys just mentioned inattention, you know, substance, uh, speeding. speeding. That's a big we thing. talked about tailgating. All these other issues seem to be as big or bigger than red lights, but we're all focused on red lights. What about bringing back technology to work on these other significant issues? I mean, I guess, does anyone want to answer that question? I don't feel like I'm making a speech, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I, I think probably the equipment is there, but it's, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, the, the powers that be, the HPD or Department of Transportation wanting to implement those types of practices. And, uh, I mean, it, it'll always involve a lot of public relations because like I said, anything automated, people are going to get suspicious. Um, that, you know, they just, they don't want to receive these things in the mail saying that you were looking at your cell phone, you know, on, on H1 or something like that. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, turning it off. Right. Um, okay, I, I, in my making my speech, and I apologize to you and the viewers for making my speech, but I got some cards, so I'm going to read these. Um, how could the system get around glazed license plate covers? So that was an issue the last time. Um, suddenly, glazed license plate covers were available at every corner so store. I recall there was, a, um, there was a police lieutenant actually selling them. That could be. I was but a low. That was one of those stories. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, so technically it's illegal now to have an obstructed license plate. So there's already a violation section in place that might not um, allow uh, an automated system to capture your license plate. You might not get a citation conceivably from a red light running camera. Um, if you ran a red light, but you probably would get pulled over and given a citation for an obstructed license plate if you're otherwise obeying the rest of the rules. But that's an equipment thing, right? So usually that's really easy. It's the to same. Get so it's it's the same. A, it's a civil infraction citation. Yeah, but it, I think usually with equipment violations, you show up in court, you say, "Judge, I got rid of it." They just drop it, right? Usually. That's. Uh, that's not true. That's, that's a, you got to bring the judge in to talk about. <laughs> oh, that. No, no, okay. Let's talk about judges in the now. courtroom. <laughs> um, will there be a public record of traffic and crossing signal repairs? There are locations where crossing signals sometimes don't work. If a driver or pedestrian is cited, will there be a record of service repairs? So is that something that gets taken into effect in these things, in other places? Like, the signal I, was broken. I, that, I think that would definitely be taken into to. account. Um, but And we can look to see um, what data we have available right now on traffic signal repairs. Because for our city and county of Honolulu, we actually contract that out to DTS. Okay, callers, relative. In California, got three tickets for creeping three inches past the stop sign. He's opposed to the red light camera. Well, again, I think that goes back to the discretion issue we had before, right? If it's a computer that takes the picture, uh, you're basically telling the computer it's over the line or it's not over the line. It's a citation or it's not a citation. And that's why I think getting away from that and getting more towards having a person who is empowered by the law to use discretion is a far superior idea to, to that. More labor intensive, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Maybe more costly from a, a, a staffing issue point of view, definitely. But yeah, I, I can't imagine giving someone a citation for three inches over the... So here, here's the, uh, the child that sees the emperor has no clothes. Traffic lights, laws are hard to enforce in heavy traffic parts of town, but it's really easy to kill pedestrians. 
the inconvenience of enforcement should not outweigh safety. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Not at all. Um, you know, this legislature began with, after, you know, unfortunately a very large number of, particularly pedestrian fatalities, we had that horrible <laughs> crash uh, in Kakaako that killed three people. Um, and there was great calls from the public for stuff. So the red light camera committee was one of them, but what other things were passed that might make us safer? We talked a little bit about the, the entering the crosswalk thing, but what else came out of it, uh, Carrie? Uh, we had um, Act, I think it's 140 or 137, I'm not sure what the Act is, but the Vision Zero uh, Act came out, and that's mm -hmm. actually gonna look at all things. And again, kind of like the red light cameras, it's coming back to the legislature and identifying policies that are best practice and actually programs, whether it's engineering or enforcement, to look at what, what are the best things we can be doing for our state. Um, that that will take, again, public to say, yes, we agree with these things. Um, in addition, we had um, another bill. I think Ben knows more about well, this. Let me ask, though, on, oh, on sure. what is the, the Vision Zero? What does that mean? What, what, what is the concept there? Uh, the, the best way I can explain it is anybody in a room can probably agree that they would not want to see anyone in their family or in their friendship, friends um, perish by a traffic crash. And so it is a lofty goal, but it, the intention is to put it out there and to look at things that actually truly do change the way we operate our roads. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of a misnomer. We think that driving is a, a guaranteed right, but it is a privilege. So we should try to keep um, fresh and knowing the laws and also identifying ways that we can slow people down where um, other people, whether older or younger, are trying to get across the road or um, stuff like that. Okay, and then um, what was the DUI? What, what came up with yeah, DUI? So the House Bill 703 uh, was signed by the governor. And basically, it uh, increased the penalties for first and second offenses. For DUIs, it increased the fines. Uh, and then what used to be a fourth offense would create, so if you have three prior DUIs and we catch you the fourth time within 10 years, uh, under the old law, that fourth offense would be a, a felony, a C felony DUI, habitual DUI. Um, the new law changes that, well, effective this past July 1st. So now if you have two priors, your third offense becomes a felony DUI. Any other um, new laws that we should highlight for folks? There's a speed speed one. So as we were talking about speeding earlier, um, actually it's it marries the Vision Zero bill, but it actually allows the state and the counties to come together and re-examine the posted speed limits in certain areas and say, you know, maybe we need to adjust these according to the users and maybe there's a high air, an area with a high um, pedestrian activity or bicyclists that all of a sudden they flood into a certain area. We may want to make the speed limit adjust to that. We're talking about speeds, um, the interesting graphics that we have here that talk about survivability of a pedestrian under different speed scenarios. And this is a little bit, uh, it's very sad actually, but uh, let me just read some of these. So if the survival rate, if you're hit by a vehicle that's going 20 miles an hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians survive. I find that just amazing. Now, if you go up just 10 miles an hour more and you're hit by a vehicle traveling at 30 miles an hour, five out of 10 survive. That's a positive way of putting it. Five out of 10 die. Um, and then on the 40 mile an hour, only one out of 10 survive. What does that tell us about, the, about, about speed limits, particularly speed limits where cars and pedestrians are intermixing, uh, Shelley? So already, like, the speed limits on roads are kind of set by the surrounding land use. So areas like po the Pali Highway in Nuuanu, that has a lower speed limit than, po say, Pali Highway further up um, between, well, back mm -hmm. then between the tunnels. And that's because you have houses um, right next to that thoroughfare. So the idea is those speed limits become lower because of the surrounding land use. Uh, Jack, would you have a problem, or is there is there a, is there a um, is there an issue about lowering speed limits? I mean, if it's not done to create speed traps. Uh, I personally, I I don't have a problem with it, but um, you do have when I know on the mainland when they've talked about lowering speed limit, a lot of the commercial businesses. Uh, uh, express concerns because of 
you know, they're under time deadlines and they got to do the deliveries and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it can be controversial. It depends where it is. Do you I think? Um, I think it's like anything else. If it's done in an open and transparent way for a, the right reason, then I think people will accept it. If it's done behind closed doors or not explained well or for some reason that people don't understand, then they're going to be suspicious. Um, I think it just comes back to the transparency. Does it have to be done kind of in that way, kind of in a comprehensive way? Like we're going to be doing this thing. We'd like your input. How, how do you pull something like that off politically? I think it's also good to look at the data. I know when we look at um, where collisions happen when just like at the posted speed limit I think the most common on Oahu is 35 is the most common speed limit where people are hit oh. it's not likely to be we, we, we think like oh it's on the freeway but it's actually taking it into account probably most of our roadways are actually at that posted speed limit as well because that's I think where the infrastructure drops off yeah. and it's more you expect more pedestrian and vehicle and bicycle interaction on your surface streets, your King Street, your Baratania, where it's 25, 35. You don't expect bicyclists on the freeway. You don't expect uh, pedestrians on the freeway. When two cars hit each other at speed, the car is designed and engineered to protect the occupants. Um, so freeway speeds is, is probably not a pedestrian fatality issue, if that makes sense. But if you took if you took a 25 mile an hour speed limit, which is the most common residential speed limit, and you cranked it down five miles an hour, and you took 30 or 35 and cranked it down five miles an hour. Would that save lives? Yes, if it's enforced, yes. If it changed behavior, yes. it would. Yes, if it changes behavior, yeah, that is, that's true. Do you think it would change behavior? Well, that's Carrie's answer, if it was enforced. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. but Darrow, it seems that most of these fatalities occur in the, in the commercial heavily populated, like Kapilani Boulevard, King Street, places like that, and I think that's where um, the, the speed and pedestrians mix and become an issue. Um, I don't know that it's in the neighborhoods that that many fatalities occur, but you see them all the time in these in downtown and you know. Mm -hmm. but, but pedestrian ones in particular. Pedestrians, yeah. yeah. Um, what about right on red? A caller from Pearl City. That was the mayor actually proposed banning right turns on red. That went exactly about as far as a red light will let you go, right? It didn't cross the line. Um, what was the objections to that? Because I think that's also situational. So you need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis with each intersection. I, I think that one potentially creates gridlock during uh, rush hour, especially in downtown and the, 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 the heavily commercial areas. Because if you don't allow right turn on red, I mean, the, the traffic isn't moving in that right lane. So. But, but you were telling us earlier that that right turn on red or left turns, that's when people get hit, right? Yeah, so the majority of our pedestrian fatalities where the pedestrian is in a crosswalk is an unprotected left-hand turn. So the driver's turning left, they're watching in front of them, they wait for that oncoming traffic lane to be clear, the pedestrian steps off the curb, typically the pedestrian's not watching, the driver's not watching, both sides fail. Um, the driver turns left and the pedestrian maybe was stepping off the crosswalk right in that A pillar of the driver's field of vision when they make that unprotected left-hand turn. So that's the majority of our crosswalk pedestrian fatalities is that unprotected left-hand turn. So we, so these are not people that are, they have violated the law only in that they've struck a pedestrian. They didn't yield to the pedestrian. Correct. So I think that's something to emphasize for every driver to hear is that that left turn when you're trying to find a hole in traffic you gotta be thinking about pedestrians, bicyclists, and stuff in that other lane. And if there's somebody there, just wait. It goes back to being distracted and being in a rush. As a bicyclist, I know that's where I get the most spooked out, is when I'm going along with traffic, I'm slower, the guys are going, that guy's looking for that hole. I, I, can, I usually, I always look for that, so, but it's, it, it makes me queasy just thinking about it. Um, Okay, a caller does think the case has been made for red light cameras. He thinks that smaller vehicles may help. Hmm. You know, one of the things, Shelly uh, Kudashiki from DOT, there's a lot of talk about technology within vehicles. Like, there's all these commercials now for the newer cars where it shows people narrowly avoiding hitting a pedestrian or narrowly getting run over by a truck. How soon do you suppose it's going to be, all of you guys might weigh in on this, before our vehicles are so much more safe that we start 
we don't need heavy duty enforcement so much of red light cameras because maybe our car won't allow us to run a red light. So I think there, recently one of the states set up a testing site for those connected and autonomous vehicles. And that's something that they're going to, we're going to be looking at very closely. Um, seeing, I, I'm sure everybody has heard about instances where like Tesla was testing or, you know, a lot of news came out when the, there was the first accident or, you know, collision with an autonomous vehicle. So that's, it's going to be a lot of testing. But I mean, 15, 20 years, what do you, th how different do you think it's going to be in 15, 20 years? I think you're years? seeing levels of autonomy in vehicles right now. <clears throat> you can buy a car that will brake assist and stop for you if you're not stopping in time. Um, you can buy a car that if you're departing out of the lane, and my wife's uh, Toyota Prius, it'll yank you back in the lane. That drives me crazy as a driver <laughs> who wants to be in control of the car. But at the same time, <laughs> you're already seeing certain levels of like level one and level two kind of autonomy um, that's happening. It, I don't think we're too far. Nanny I don't want to be the cars will fly in 10 years guy, but um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think you're really all that far. Every model year of car that comes out is, is one step closer. It often seems like when we, when we put in a new piece of technology, by the time government gets around to putting in a new technology, it's already obsolete. So by the time we get around to the red light cameras, the cars will be stopping by themselves. Or it'll all be roundabouts. <laughs> um, driving slow is a serious problem here, the caller says. I speed to get away from the many drivers who are confused, <laughs> so I have as much space around me as possible. DOT doesn't educate people about driving too slow. Well, he brought you up, but... I'll, I'll take that card. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> gonna... <laughs> yeah, beware. Oh. The, the safest thing to do is travel with the flow of traffic. And again, it goes back to being impatient, being in a rush, being trying to get away from other... I, I get it. Uh, I get the psychology. There's open road up ahead, but um, a lot of times... Uh, and there, in fact, there was a city council bill about this, that if, like on King Street, right, five, six lanes uh, across, and the cars in front of you are going too slow, and you go to the right, and maybe they're going slow because there's a pedestrian in, in the crosswalk, marked or unmarked. Uh, so the, the city council allowed uh, drivers to turn on their hazard lights, right? That was a kind of an issue. First, they were, they were going to make it mandatory, and then they kind of backed <laughs> off a little bit and made it optional to warn other people. But um, I, I don't think any of us are driving slow on purpose. There's probably mm, some sort there's of a reason. reason. Yeah. yeah. You know, I could see myself like, oh, I can hit my hazards. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, go ahead. <laughs> what you were saying? Okay. Police are city employees. Fines go to state general fund. That drives you guys crazy. That's right? everything. The speed citations, everything we do, DUI, fines, arrests, it all goes, that's just kind of the, the cost of doing business now. So, I mean, it is an issue with red light running cameras, right, if we're going to devote resources to issuing citations. Um, it's just kind of the job, I think. There's a lot of talk in the legislature where they say, oh, I mean, the public defender's office and just civil rights folks say it's not really a great idea for the city to get paid for issuing citations, no. right? Yeah. What's, what's, what's the problem there? Well, because it, it creates that perception that you're going to issue more citations to make more money. So, I mean, it, your citations, and that's the, that's the problem with the private vendors, too. So... Uh, you know, violations of the law shouldn't be handed out because you want to make more of a profit. There shouldn't be a profit, profit making for yeah, justice, right? a venture. Yeah, for safety exactly. over. Yeah. Well, but I think Hawaii is a unique enough place that this kind of a committee <clears throat> could come up with an arrangement where the state pays maybe for the infrastructure and the police do the enforcement. So it's not our vested interest to issue more citations, but at the same time, it's not the county taxpayer. Um, who's paying for the cameras and the sensors. You have to disconnect the financial incentive from the citations. Absolutely. Should, like su be sustainable in the cost and that would be probably the best. Yeah, of and, and there's a third branch of government that has another beef with the funding which is the courts right. because they say we have to now uh, uh, entertain all these new new cases of uh, red light or speeding or whatever it is so we should you know, get an increase in our budget because we're going to have to have more judges and clerks and so forth to process all these cases. Oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> um, are police, firefighters, EMS, city and state legislators and officials exempt from red light cameras on and off duty? I guess it's on for the committee. On and off duty? <laughs> mm. I wonder if that was a state legislator I'm calling it. <laughs> State legislators, no. Police, yes, no. Um, <laughs> so if the, the law allows for the police, fire, and EMS when responding to an emergency situation with their emergency equipment activated, 
Uh, it allows them to violate certain sections of the traffic law, but it doesn't uh, erase civil liability. So if I run a red light in my police car to get through and I hit somebody and I have the red, then I, 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 I'm still in it. Um, last question. Everyone is driving 50 to 20 miles over the speed limit on all islands. Anyone driving above that limit should be fined $20 for each mile over the limit. I think the implication is, can we? why don't we just increase fines for all these things so people don't do it? Is that something that's easier and more valid? Than I would say we tried um, in the previous years. Mm -hmm. um, to raise fines, make mm -hmm. the fines higher? Yeah. And what happened? It, didn't go it died. Yeah. It just dies. <laughs> well, I've seen some of these legislators drive, so well, it could I be. I think part of the concern was that it would, it would unfair, getting that type of, the, a large fine would be financially devastating to poor, um, to lower income. Okay, well, we are done. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, and I'll thank all of you for joining us tonight. And we thank our guests individually, Shelley Kunishigi from the Department of Transportation, Captain Ben Moskowitz from the Honolulu Police Department's Traffic Division, Jack Tanaki, the State Public Defender, and Carrie Bennis, Chair of the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. I learned about what that was today. Next week on Insights, tour helicopters. Should there be stronger safety regulations to protect passengers and people on the ground as well as rules to reduce noise. Join that conversation next Thursday. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.